Hello, wizards. My name is Tyler. And my name is Brooke. And this is Cosmere Cosmere Conversations. All you lovely listeners, and welcome back to another episode of the book club. We are looking at the Frugal Wizards Handbook. Yes, it has a longer title, but this is the shortened version, or FWH, if you really want to go short. Ain't nobody got time to see that entire title. But we do have multiple episodes to talk about it, so stay tuned as we are going to be exploring Runian dimensions and kind of the different plot points of the frugal wizards handbook before we dive into that we want to give a little shout out to a new patron christian welcome christian great to have you on the patreon and for any of you out there who have already read secret project number three we are currently well we are just about to start our secret project three book club on Patreon, they get first access. Uh, if you are reading the Frugal Wizards handbook, then you're in the right place. Yes. Here and for the next few episodes, I think we got five total in the book club. We will be diving deep into or maybe climbing up the world tree in our exploration of this story. But Secret Project number three going on on the patron now. Good time to join up. If you don't want to join the Patreon, but you would still like to do something nice for the community here at Cosmere Conversations, you can give us a rating or review on any platform where that is possible. Yeah, we do not do this all the time or every episode, but it is summertime here in the Northern Hemisphere, and we are celebrating our birthdays this month and next. So for all the positive vibes to go around, please rate and review us. We will be so appreciative of you, and we hope that you appreciate The Frugal Wizard's Handbook to Surviving Medieval England, we've got an intense episode for you today, and maybe a couple of intense episodes. Clearly, this is not a Cosmere book, and so we don't have maybe the normal tie-ins. Yeah, obviously, it's not going to tie into the things that we do know, and so we're kind of starting over from scratch in terms of the mythology and what is going on. On this world. So there are going to be a couple of information dense episodes, but I think these are really helpful because some of this mythological information and information about the magic and what is happening on this world is sort of sprinkled throughout at different points, which obviously is good to prevent it sounding like too much exposition all at once, but it can make it difficult to really track everything that is going on. So that's where we come in. We've put it all together for you in one easy to understand digestible format. That may be divided into several episodes depending on how long it takes us to get through this dense information and how many possible tangents I go on because not only are we being introduced to a new world, it's also a world with similarities to our own. And right. in story, there is an Earth that is you know, seemingly our Earth, but with new technology it's like so many aspects of this story are kind of like weaving themselves together and that includes a lot of norse mythology as we would understand it and that's what we're going to look at today the in-world mythology probably not appropriate to call it norse but you know it's something akin to that for this world well as you're saying it ties into what we know from our World. So not only are we sort of trying to understand the mythology of this dimension, but if 
we as human beings here in this dimension are not familiar with any of Norse mythology, then we're also trying to learn Norse mythology because the things that exist here in this dimension have bearing on what's happening in that other dimension. That's a, a great point. And For ease, I am using just the word Earth to refer to our dimension and or the dimension that John comes from. Oh, okay. I'm just saying Earth because it Got is it. more straightforward. <laughs> That's helpful. And we're going to do a couple of those linguistic tricks to try to simplify. Yes. And this is where we come across another problem, which is a lot of the words or the mythologies, these stories are originally from a language that is not English, the one that you are currently listening to and that we speak. So a lot of the words we're going to be throwing out, the names we're going to be throwing out, we are going to mispronounce them. Yes. If you are a Norris mythology scholar, we apologize in advance. Please don't add us. Let's start down at the roots of the world tree and claw our way up as we discover this pantheon that is at least from a reader's perspective, far more intertwined and significant to this world that we see in the Frugal Wizard's Handbook. Yeah, I think it's important to start with kind of the central myth story mm -hmm. that feeds into all of the events of the story that we read. Here is kind of a rundown of events according to the West Warrens, like Sephowin and Aelston, what happened in their past history slash myth. It's mm -hmm. kind of unclear. Uh, however, in this story, Woden is married to Frigg. Frigg created writing. The West Warrens used to live somewhere else. They fled their homeland, fleeing from the Hordemen. So that sort of predatory uh, relationship still continues, as we see in the Frugal Wizard's handbook. When the West Warrens arrived on the British Isle, the Waelish were already living there, and they welcomed the West Warrens in, they gave them land, but then later they wanted that land back. And the Black Bear is the Waelish king who is doing most of the trying to take the land back. Perfect introduction, and now my role, I'm going to try to give a little bit of context so that people can maybe ground themselves. Because if we were looking at our Earth, this is a very similar story to the people of what is now today, Norway, Sweden, Denmark, and even the Netherlands kind of all experienced a version of this tale when because of warring tribes, because of disease, because of any pressures. They were forced out across the seas to find new areas, new land. And we saw a lot of this in our own history with people arriving on the English Isles and then conflict ensuing over the people who were there and the new arrivers. Sometimes those people came as victims and kind of like refugees. And then the establishment of uh, an intermingled society was maybe far more common. And then other times there were straight conquest and invaders. And so with the West Warren people and kind of their origin story does seem to start from more of this like refugee being pushed out of probably an area like southern Sweden and arriving in medieval England. It also seems that the gods of the West Warrens traveled with them to this new land because as the black bear is warring with them, trying to take back this land that they had been given, the gods fight with their people against the black bear. And it is said that the black bear, quote, turned to darkness in desperation, end quote, and there is a sort of magical-ish uh, description of like the land being uh, covered in darkness and black something. So there's sort of a mystical connection between the black bear's desperation and a physical effect on the land. Again, unclear if that's like poetry in the storytelling mm -hmm. or if it is something that 
actually literally happened. What is really interesting about Norse mythology in general is that oftentimes they use people and or we'll say entities as symbols for entire eras or entire periods of time, be they good or bad, become summarized and explained in a personified individual. That's interesting. Yeah. I didn't and know so that. this concept of like, is it poetry or did something actually like physically happen in the land when the black bear is on this uh, kind of like revenge counterattack, so to speak? But the, you know, it's hard to tell because there is, we're getting everything secondhand and that information is not shown to us on the page. But I think that there is a lot to be said for just the idea of the black bear represents something and like represents an idea or concept and that drives and motivates other people and it becomes like the way to easily explain when you say like the black bear it carries a weight behind it because more than just the individual is kind of tied up in the story of that person i think that's true for the story i just want to be clear that i do think the black bear like is a actual entity that exists in the dimension that John is inhabiting. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I'm not saying yeah, yeah, he yeah. is a, a purely mythological character or anything like that. He's definitely a real person. Similar to the gods that we see, like Logna. They are myths and they are also real. So I just want that to be clear. So the black bear in this conflict contest comes to be able to control Fenris, who is the great wolf, obviously similar to our Fenrir mm -hmm. in our Norse mythology, uh, a great wolf used to be bound by one of the gods. The black bear is able to uh, get the wolf and control it. And quote, Fenris brought with him the implements of Medagodas, the end of gods, end quote. And Fenris is also described as, quote, that wolf who would consume the world, end quote. So we have this character, the black bear, who is kind of bringing about the potential end or the like the implement, the way that the gods can die in this world. And that is central to Norse mythology as we understand it. It is a cyclical belief system in that their entire mythology is based around the idea of a cycle repeating itself over and over. And the end of days is known as Ragnarok. And we obviously have uh, some Marvel cinematic <laughs> movies that you may be familiar with and have heard that phrase before. But it is a concept that is real, and I'm really fascinated how the normal people, Sephawin and her people, take this ideology of a cyclical death, knowing, believing deep in your soul that everything is going to end and start over, I think like changes the mindset and kind of how these people live. And we'll talk mm. maybe in another episode about their society's focus on violence and how that can be counteracted. But we have this, you know, great wolf that is being controlled by the black bear setting up the end of days. Yeah, I think the most significant uh, sort of part of that cyclical idea for this specific story is that there is a circumstance in which gods can die. And because the gods are able to die, uh, at this point, when Fenris is brought into the battle, they're afraid. Of, of dying. Course. Yes. <laughs> and so they leave the battle. They're like, oh, dang, Fenris is here. Like, we out. However, obviously, the humans are still fighting and dying, and the humans are crying out for help from their gods. And so Frigg answers this call. This is Woden's wife. She answers. She goes back to the battlefield to fight, and she gets there, she starts declaring the best and most powerful boasts that have ever been heard. Her boasts are powerful enough to drive back the black bear and bind him to his lands as whites are bound to a specific area. So the black bear is now confined. However, Fenris is still free 
And it said that he consumes Frigg. Unclear if that's like a literal eating or if it's something more metaphorical. But Frigg has been weakened by her fight. She goes down. She's dead. Fenris kills her. Quote, with her dying breath, she bound the wolf to the hill of the black bear to slumber until the final death of gods. End quote. So MVP, way to go, Frigg. Destroyed the black bear or at least confined him. Mm -hmm. Also confined Fenris. Really just hero of the day. And for that sacrifice, there is an immense change to the world. And it is, of course, questionable in the story world what is going to happen next. But generally speaking, when Fenris begins his consumption of the gods, it does not end like until all of them are dead. And so we have basically come into this tale in the middle of a Ragnarok. Well, I think this is kind of one of the cruxes of the story and the way that this dimension maybe diverged from our dimension because something happened that wasn't supposed to happen, basically. Because even in the mythology of this world, prior to this moment, there is a different god who is sort of prophesied to be killed by Fenris mm -hmm. kicking off the Medad Godas. And because Frigg changes that story right is the one that dies instead of the god who was supposed to die yes everything is weird and so my theory is that this is maybe the point where their dimension diverged from ours i think that's a great call i would also just point us to the fact that in norse mythology that concept that you just described of hey the thing that we were expecting to happen happened in a way that was unexpected is built into Norse mythology. Like that thing happens often in the stories. And so seeing the potential for the end of the world or Ragnarok and expecting it to go one way and then it going a different way. And then our characters, you know, believing, oh, we've averted the crisis. We have Oh. stop Ragnarok. Well, in and this it's world, all... they're actually kind of mad about it. Exactly. But I, it's a... <laughs> they're like, this is not a good thing. <laughs> it's a way of, you feel like you have diverged, but the story of Ragnarok like, has a way of refocusing. This is how it was supposed to go all the time. Kind of. Basically, it's just like, Ragnarok doesn't care about the particular method of destruction yeah. of the gods. It's just like, everything is going to begin again. And so I'm very curious about like, is this a good thing or is it a bad thing? Has... Is Ragnarok still in the process or has it actually mm. been like diverted and we're on some type of new route? Yeah. Yeah. So we have Frigg who's dead and basically changed the world completely, but gave hope back to the world. However, Woden obviously just lost his wife. So he is pissed and he's like, hey, humans, you are now no longer able to write. Freya gave you writing and I'm taking it away because you are the reason why she's dead. Quote, now Woden's sons punish any mortals who desecrate her memory. Only Logna, ever tricky and calculating, dares disobey, end quote. Yeah, we have a role for Logna in this story to kind of act as a Prometheus uh, from the yeah, other a little bit. Yeah. pantheon, but like bringing fire against the will of Zeus and the gods and then being punished for that. Logna here is bringing writing to the humans and is going to be kind of like hunted and punished for that effort. But we have this mechanism or like this defense mechanism that Woden has put in place around writing is a huge part of mm. Frugal Wizard's Handbook yes. and kind of the key marker that John uses to like understand that there is real magic, not just technology or some aspect of his world's incredible technology. It is something unique about this planet and this world. And it's the stuff that we talked about in our very first episode doesn't really come into focus or start to come into focus until the last couple of pages. And then we're sent off by the epilogue with a yeah. lot more to <laughs> speculate about. 
<laughs> so Logna steals writing from Woden. She gives it back to the humans. And the fact that the humans accepted that gift means that they are one step closer to worshiping Logna as their main god instead of Woden, which is basically where we pick up with the world, with Woden and Logna mad at each other, sort of both interested in this West Warren people. The West Warrens, for the most part, it seems, still view Woden as their main dude mm -hmm. and are like, no, we're not going to write. We promise. Please take us back. <laughs> And we see how that plays out through the story. Now that we've got sort of our central myth outlined, let's dig more into each of our main mythological characters, starting with, of course, Woden. To give the quick comparison, this is, of course, Odin, the all-father, big daddy of the Norse mythology. Namer of the day, Wednesday. There's going to be a lot of etymology in this episode, which I'm really excited about. So buckle up, etymological babies. So recognizing that there are many a names for each of these characters, we'll try to use the appropriate one for this story. So Woden and most of the information about him says that he's associated with royalty, war, battle, victory, frenzy, death the gallows, healing, sorcery, wisdom, knowledge, poetry, and the runic alphabet, which we see best on display fueling or being part of kind of the magic system in this world. Yeah, so this is sort of who Odin, Woden is understood to be in terms of Earth, what we, what our histories and mythologies tell us about the beliefs around Woden. Obviously, we see some of this uh, leaking into the character of Woden in this other dimension. There are a lot of different variations on the name for this god, Woden, in different languages from the past. Ultimately, they all stem from a word that means lord of frenzy or leader of the possessed, which I found really interesting. There is also an adjective form of the same word, meaning possessed or enraged. And this word is related to Celtic words for like a seer or a prophet, also used to describe poetic inspiration. So you can see how all of this is sort of tied into the world of the Frugal Wizard's handbook, with Woden eventually leading the Hordemen in this sort of war frenzy, and the power of the land being poetry or boasts. It's kind of all in there, and it all comes from something real on Earth, which I think is really interesting. Let's look at how Woden is described in the Frugal Wizard's Handbook. Logna at one point says that a man who has scraggly hair and one eye reminds her of her brother. So that's really the only physical description that we get of Woden. But there are a lot of descriptions of sort of Woden's character, who he is, what he's like. From the text, we have, quote, We live beneath the eye of Woden, she said, to whom this land belongs, he who claims all words and arranged all worlds, end quote. Woden is often said to require and enjoy sacrifice and even suffering from his people. And Sefawin says quite a few times that she believes that once they have sacrificed enough, suffered for long enough, that's when they can earn Woden's forgiveness. And it is Aelston who counters this point with, no, he only wants the sacrifice and the suffering. There's no promised end. There's no promised glory. The thing that Woden is interested in is the sacrifice, is the suffering. And I love the tie with a frenzy, especially like a battle frenzy or mm, a war yeah. frenzy that reminds us that war is always awful and there's not necessarily a happy result after any type of conflict battle, you know, be it a small one or a large war. It doesn't mean that like because a war was fought, 
you got to a good end result, which is kind of what Sephawin is saying. Like, we're going to sacrifice now, but mm, at the end, everything's- It'll all gonna... be worth it. Exactly. And I think that a lot of times in the real world and what Ailston is pointing out is like, no, this- could just be pain forever. Yeah. There's certainly an element of the sort of punishing mm -hmm. God to this thought process that I think Yazad shines a little bit of light on with the contrast with his religion being very kind and loving, setting up in even, you know, starker terms the cruelty of this God that the West Warrens are worshiping. For another quote from the text, we have this, quote, Woden forgets himself and thirsts for increasing devotion, Thok said softly, like a drunkard calling for more wine, end quote. Again, a alcoholic frenzy, also something that seems <laughs> to go hand in hand with Woden. Yeah, and I think she's kind of calling out a little bit of something is going wrong with the god it reminds me a little bit of things that we see in the cosmere with, with the heralds and... with the heralds and honor and things like that there's this tiny hint that mm, he might be going off the deep end a little bit especially with the information that we get at the very end in the epilogue that thok herself logna is possibly not of this world maybe that's setting up a none of these gods are of this world, Woden yeah. included. I think that's a huge question that we don't necessarily have an answer to. I know. I can speculate yeah. heavily on that particular point because I mentioned the idea like, okay, did someone arrive in the past and kind of take the place of the stories that already existed on this planet? Right. Or did someone arrive and around them was birthed the story? Like, are they really Woden? And they've been that person the entire time. All the stories come from them. If that's the case, maybe there is a little Cosmere-esque thing going on with time being a detriment to these godlike mm, characters. Yeah. So many questions. Unfortunately, not answers. But yeah. we can go deep <laughs> into the archives. Why don't you give us some context uh, directly from Ailston? Quote, Woden doesn't reward diligence, Ailston said. He never has. He rewards blood offerings, carnage, and conquest, end quote. And so to me, it makes a lot of sense why these people, the West Warrens, are so afraid of Woden and the Hordermen. You know, they seem to be, like I said, a group of kind of refugees. They're the people who lost. Like, they are not the victors. That's the Hordermen, who we must imagine are, you know, the main group of these people the historical ancestors and the people who if the gods are real like these are the gods people are the hordemen not the west warrens the west warrens are the losers of some battle that oh. pushed them out of their homeland well it sounded like the the west warrens gods came with them when they left their homeland and it's not until this story that we read that woden defects and sides with the Hordeman instead. Sure. I love the concept of like the gods moving with them. It reminds me of Neil Gaiman's story, American Gods, mm. where you had the, you know, the people from or the gods from the ancient worlds coming to America and then things morphing and changing around them. My interpretation was that, yeah, there's almost like a cognitive realm aspect of these people have a belief of mm. these gods when they travel of course the belief travels with them which means something comes over we have no reason to believe that there is a physical cognitive spiritual yeah. realm in this dimension but i at least think of things along those lines and that if that was the case I would kind of describe what happened as like the cognitive shadow of Woden was brought over with the West Warrens and Woden could kind of choose, you know, where to go. He could go with the people that direction. And I think he probably, you know, had all of the ability to do that if he wanted to, but he did not. He stayed with the Hordermen or like reverted back to the Hordermen. And then we have the continuing conflict. Let's talk about Woden's prohibition on writing and what it means for these people. It is now said that any written word is 
going to draw Woden's attention and provoke his ire. So even if someone is not actively writing, just having a piece of paper with writing on it will apparently draw his attention. And I'm very curious if this is actual, if this is a real thing that this entity we know of as Woden, who, as you said, seems to be maybe just another world hopper Mm -hmm. and therefore kind of a regular person. Right. Like, what is the mechanism for this attention drawing thing? It could totally just be a myth, you know, magical fantasy thing in their world. But there's just a little note of curiosity in my brain as to how it might be real. Yeah, if there is some type of technology or some mechanism that could be understood for what is going on. But we do see the destruction of writing via Thunderbolt, right? Yeah. So I think uh, Thor dropping down some of the anger from Woden on behalf. I wonder if there is, because of the way mythology often worked in the ancient world across our whole planet, is that aspects of the natural environment were said to be a god or a mythological character in one way, shape, or form. I'm wondering if the creation of writing you know, was also the creation of a little god for writing. And maybe that character is what Woden is able to use. So hypothetically, stay with me here. In this world, Frigg invents writing. Yes. But in Norse mythology, every type of invention, every type of thing is represented by a person. It's personified, right? So what if that invention of writing is personified by a little baby, a child of Woden and Frigg? If Woden has that child, they may be the mechanism that allows him to know where all writing is because that's their thing. They Uh are the tiny god of writing, like Loki Hmm. is the god of tricksters or Thor is the god of thunder. Interesting. We don't really see anything. Definitely don't have any evidence. Yes. But that's that's an interesting tidbit. It's a crazy Cosmere conjecture corner, but not for the Cosmere. Yeah. (laughs) This prohibition on writing also sheds and interesting light on the nature of these gods being locationally based. So another thing that kind of ties into the Cosmere, it's a little fun to see how like Cosmere-ish theories come into these non-Cosmere works. Because Yazad says that, quote, many in his lands do it freely, end quote. Writing is fine. It doesn't provoke any lightning bolts to come down from the sky, which implies that these god entities have sort of defined jurisdictions or there's some type of limit on their power and what they can do. And we see characters like the Black Bear bound to a land or a region. We also see in stories like the video game series God of War, a very similar thing where the main character begins in Greece or ancient Greece as dealing with those gods and physically walks and is trying to escape those gods and all like the chaos of his past. He goes north and at a certain point, the power of those gods is weakened and he's like freed from being hunted by them, but he arrives in the Norse mythology. And so he like pisses off those people and begins the new series that has come out within the last couple of years. So we've definitely seen like aspects of this kind of regionality to the gods power. And I think it's a really fun thing to play around with. I also like the idea of, you know, maybe Woden in this moment, this kind of transitional period of time when his people are spreading and branching out and one group of them the west warrens ends up on medieval england it's like a a opportunity for him to expand his power in a certain way Mm. and maybe he chooses to like stay in the homeland because that's where more of his power is located consolidate right exactly don't stretch yourself too thin uh, mentality maybe and so he might seem like an all-powerful entity 
but he may have like real limitations yeah. that we we experience, but we don't necessarily understand why he's doing things. Exactly. Like, why did he choose the Horderman? It could just be as simple as like his power is regional. He has more power with the Horderman than he does in medieval England because that's like a new land. Yeah. We're going to get some quotes about that Lovely. in just a sec. How might Woden be good? We've talked a lot about his his downsides. Sephawin believes that Woden is their only hope to defend against the Black Bear. The Black Bear might be confined, but he is still out there. Mm-hmm. I think Yazad even says at one point that the West Warrens are in a terrible position of being between the ocean, where right. the Hordemen come from, and the Black Bear, who's just lurking in the forest, you know, waiting for them basically to step out of line. He would totally go back to war with them. And so their only hope is that Woden will forgive them and potentially once again come to their aid should they again war with the Black Bear. Aelston just believes that Woden and the gods are afraid because obviously they're afraid of Ragnarok and he's much more pessimistic about the likelihood of Woden helping them. As previously mentioned, Woden defects from the West Warren, sides with the Horderman. And we have this from the text, quote, My brother cares only about who is winning. He always wants to be on the side that is going to be victorious, end quote. Which makes me think that this was the central deciding factor Mm -hmm. for Woden. Exactly. Maybe not necessarily that there were more believers in the homeland of the Horderman, but simply that the Horderman are... Stronger, more warlike, yeah, more vicious. Well, uh, think of the difficulty you just presented with the West Warren's position in a new land. They're caught in between the native people, the Waelish, and the Hordermen attacking from the ocean. They don't seem like a group that you would bet on if, again, maybe his power, maybe all the gods' power is somehow tied into being victorious or like having Mm. a group of people who believe in you and so if you i don't know it seems like it's more about just the black bear that woden would be thinking if the black bear ever does come back he has the instrument like basically the only thing that could kill me woden and i don't want to do that and if i am on the side of the west warrens i would have to 100%. So I'm just going to go find some new worshippers who are not fighting the black bear. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I, I would think that he it's a way of consolidating, as we talked about, or just avoiding a fight with the maybe one thing that can kill you. Yeah. It's like, why go over? This is how I would behave whenever Nightblood showed up in a room. I would just stop, turn around, walk away. Just be like, <laughs> I don't want to be anywhere near your sword of sucking death. Like, that's not <laughs> what I'm interested in. And I think that maybe we've seen some characters in the Cosmere who react that way to powerful weapons or powerful entities. Hoyd might just be an example of them. He doesn't necessarily put himself in a position where he has to fight things that are stronger than him, or at least mm. a, a, an equivalent in strength. Sure. And that could be what Woden is doing, just avoiding fighting the thing that could be the end of him. There's another good quote from Logna, quote, no amount of blood or sacrifice could have sated him, Aelston. Woden is frightened of the pain these outsiders bring, of losing control, He needs this city to burn, these people to die, so that he can pretend it's his punishment for disobedience, end quote. So basically, this whole war, this whole conflict is just about Woden's insecurities. (laughs) I think that's on point for almost all wars. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Then Logna says something that spiked my curiosity. She says that Woden has always been the enemy of the West Warrens. Even before Frigga's death. I mean, she says always. Exactly. So yeah, forever. Which uh, I, there's no clues as to what that actually means behind the scenes or anything like that. I just thought it was something to star. Yeah. Well, if we are putting a marker, I also want the asterisk there that points us back to the question, is Logna, are these gods not from this world. Yeah. And if there was a conflict akin to what we see between John and Ulrich, that type of conflict, but instead replace the names with Woden and Logna, 
that has been, you know, going back to their very beginning. Hmm. And we have... Or I think just the concept that if Logna and Woden at one point came to this dimension mm -hmm. as dimension hoppers, they are also interdimensional colonists. Yes. And therefore, therefore don't have the best interests of the people at heart. They're here for power. Exactly. And if there is some aspect of their power that requires... Okay, my brain just exploded a little bit. <laughs> Excellent. Hit me with it. What'd you got? There is an excerpt of the in-world handbook that describes the different packages mm -hmm. wizards can get as they do their interdimensional travel. And one of them is a game, basically, where you can go to a dimension with another person. Most of the time, yeah, this is me. by yourself. This is what I would be doing in this world. I love <laughs> this one. I was so into it. The but, war gaming. Yeah, there's one where you can go with another person and the institution yep. that is selling you the package sets you up, puts you in the place that you're going to be, and then you and your adversary right. are trying to amass the loyalty and the weapons and get yourself set up for a war. Yeah. It's a what little... if Logna and Woden Bought are that. just those two people from whatever, 500 years ago? Exactly. The weird aspect that I don't think is fully dealt with, but at least is introduced with that final epilogue, is we're told a lot of things by the Frugal Wizard Company about how many dimensions there are and how it's impossible to run into someone else's dimension. But we don't know that. And if you really were being a cheap corporation, why wouldn't you just recycle? Stack? Yes. Yeah. Why wouldn't you stack dimensions and just separate it by time? You're not going to have most people alive longer than 100 years or something like that. So you can send someone back to 200 AD, 500 AD, 700 oh. AD, 1000 well, AD, and you can have all of them. And then you just- I don't think that's quite how it works. But this is not the episode about- The dimensions. Time travel. Yeah, we're going to do a whole bit. other episode about that. So I do not want to go down that river, so to speak. I do love this idea, though, that if- we have the dimension hoppers of Woden and Logna. They know, or at least Logna knows, that the gods don't have the people's best interests at heart because they are not their people. They're just another, they're playthings. And if that is what's going on, I there's just a lot of questions. And I'm kind of bummed that we don't have the potential of jumping yeah, back into this world. Totally. I want some fan fiction. Get on it, peeps. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, let's jump over to Logna, who we actually see more of literally physically in the book, just for some context from our own Earth mythology and some fun etymology. I, when reading the word Logna, immediately started to think about the Latin root log, which has to do with words. Uh, mm -hmm. As in dialogue, monologue, prologue, epilogue, et cetera, et cetera. Because this world has so much to do with words, I thought that was really interesting. However, it is also connected and probably more closely linguistically connected to Loki from Norse mythology. Pretty cool that you could combine those two things and have it be Loki and also word-related in your word-related story. <laughs> In Norse mythology, Loki is a shapeshifter who, among other things, appears as an elderly woman named Thok, which in Old Norse means thanks. Thok. Fun fact. The word Loki is thought to come from a Germanic root, which means a knot or a lock or a closed room. So confusing things, maybe, <laughs> sort of like being confined in some way. Uh, it's also connoted with spiders, ropes, and being tied up or trapped. Yes, I love this concept that Loki is the tangler or yeah. the causer of problems. Yeah, literally, linguistically, that's what the word means, which then goes into our understanding of Loki as a trickster. And redefines or helps me redefine what 
a trickster actually is. Yes, absolutely. And I think that gives even more context to the performance in Marvel's movies Mm. with Thor and Loki, where Loki's the villain in the first Avengers movie, who obviously has a redemption-esque story. But one of the things that happens towards the end of his one life, we'll say, is a almost recognition from Thor about like what both of them are mm. almost like it's something that can't be helped yeah that, like i know you loki you have always been this way you've always done this i just wanted a brother and you wanted to be you are the tangler exactly and it's it's almost like not necessarily his fault and then because yeah of the, it's like a recognition of the archetype 100 percent. that's an excellent description we talked about the main quote that is given in regards to the description of Thok, which comes from Aelston, quote, the mother of monsters, the stealer of words, and harbinger of the end of the time of the gods, end quote. That last one is the one that really got me. Tell me why. It made me, we we see Logna as a kindly figure sure. in this story. She's helping out our main guy. She's fighting against this demonstrably evil dude, Woden. Like, she seems pretty cool. Her name means thanks. So, like, you know. How bad could it be? So nice. Yeah. But if she is the harbinger of the end times, that makes me think that the story we just read is actually not a good story. Like kind of like you were saying with Ragnarok. Like exactly. wait, Ragnarok is not actually gone. It is actually happening right now. 100%. And I think that is part of the God of War series where there is a Loki character who kind of through no fault of his own, it's not because he wants the gods to die, leaving off Logna here in this situation. But it's his role in the story, the way that the story develops around him means that like everything is happening because of him and is triggered by him, but it's not necessarily his fault. Which is going back to the archetype of this character, this archetype just being what it is right. and being... As you were saying, the gods in North mythology existing as personifications of concepts that Logna, Loki, is the concept of change, conflict, problems, tangles that have to exist, right, in order for life to go on. It's kind of like a preservation ruin scenario. You have to have ruin so that things can change yeah i think oftentimes we see the loki character as the spider who has spun the web but i almost imagine it as the fly who's gotten caught in the web tangled in the web and in their fight Hmm. in their struggle to get out they are causing more chaos you know but i think the spider metaphor is Good, because you can't blame a spider for making webs. Absolutely. That's just what they do. Like, spiders make webs. You can't be mad at it. I definitely would not be mad at the spider making webs unless it's too close to me. And then I'm like, get your web out of here, my man. Yeah, agreed. Logna is also known to be a good storyteller and is compared to scops in that way. When she is disguised as Thok, she is described as, quote, an older woman who bore a basket of sticks. She moved slowly, likely because of her advanced years. She was short and thick of body with long white hair she kept in a bun stuck through with wooden sticks, end quote. She's also described as having a round face and cheerful eyes, and she is posing as a traveling hearth keeper who's selling tinder. As we talked about last time, this is just the cabbage salesman from (laughs) Avatar, but in female form. It sounds yeah. great. Like, just cheerful eyes. Yeah, I love myself some cheerful exactly. eyes. Exactly. A round little face. Just a cute little old lady. Nope. Harbinger. Harbinger. <laughs> okay, let's talk a little bit about Logna's abilities and tangential items. First one being that 
Logna's children, quote, the monsters, end quote, live in the dark forest kingdom of the black bear. Presumably, this is including Fenris, and Fenris is also her child, which would be in keeping with our Earth mythology. It doesn't actually say that in the Frugal Wizard, but that's what I would assume. Logna can also improve a person's sight. She allows Runian to see whites. And I am very interested in this concept because the normal understanding is that whites can never be seen or that if you do see a white, then it ends in your death or the white's death instantaneously. Kind of pulling back the veil of this world is very, you know, Loki-esque. A good storyteller also knows when to attack the fourth wall and kind of bring the audience in. And how to do a reveal. 100%. (laughs) I think that we have probably also seen the same thing with Cephalin as well. Yeah, Cephalin is also able to see Wyatt's and I think that that is a unique ability. I don't think that all scops right. are able to see whites. So my guess is that Logna in this devious quest to disempower Woden at some point in the past started using Cephalin as a long-term spy weapon and setting her up for that incredible moment that Cephalin has at the end of the story. Absolutely. And Logna said that she was looking for someone to attack Woden for a long time. It would make sense that you kind of, you know, plant seeds and just see how they sprout Cephalin growing up the best. Yeah, she says in that moment when they're waiting to see what Cephalin is going to do and if she's going to be killed by all the Hordemen, Logna says something like, just wait, this has been building in her for a long time. And so that to me was also a clue that maybe Logna had a hand in cultivating Cephalin's skills and powers. Yeah, to me, we have a little bit of a cultivation-esque vibe from Logna. Long-term plans. Definitely. (laughs) Planting their little seeds, growing them up until eventually they slap their hands together and merge the three realms into one. But uh, we do know that Logda is not powerful enough to challenge Woden on her own, similar to maybe how cultivation cannot directly challenge Odium. And so this kind of method of weakening or or setting up a perfect situation has kind of Hoyd-esque vibes as well, you know, small adjustments to get the goal you want down the road. I think that's also very cultivation in that she is patient. Mm -hmm. She's biding her time, waiting for the right moment when Woden has been weakened by other things, and then she takes advantage of that moment. She's ready to make her move. Now, what I found most fascinating about Logna's powers or abilities was this, quote, she could steal any word. It was one of her things, End quote. And that comes directly from Logna. Exactly. That's really the only sentence that is hard confirming an ability of Logna. And I think in the next sentence or the next paragraph, she is directly talking about the password for John's uh, exactly. chest protection. Yes. And I am interested because as far as I know, that word never existed in this dimension. It only ever existed in... John's Earth, and was, if we are to believe Ulrich and his men, you know, randomly typed in. It was never memorized. It was never written down. There's no reason to think, like, what? where did she steal the word from? It was a random collection of letters. I guess, technically speaking, it has to be in the computer to recognize the password. Like, it's stored there, uh, you know, locally on John. So maybe that's the answer. But I am just, like, curious, like, what does it mean to steal a word? Clearly, it doesn't have to be a very direct type of experience of, like, that's a page I can see, and I'm going to take that word off slowly. She's doing something way more in-depth than just that. 
I am reading a book right now in which there is a god character who eats memories. And Mm. specifically, she eats the word of a place name. And when she eats, like, the city name, no person on the planet can even think of that word it, like anymore. Like doesn't exist. Yeah. yeah it deletes it, just, it from existence. Yes, exactly. And I feel like this is sort of similar, but the reverse, like Logna can find right. any word in this metaphysical way. It almost goes back to like a cognitive realm, like you were saying, like the word exists somewhere in the cognitive realm exactly. that Logna is able to access and find. Very interesting. Because she's also able to quote unquote find the encryption passwords for all of the files on Ryan's computer. Exactly. And again, how or where is she stealing that from is an interesting question. Yeah. But the particularly combined with the fact that machines hurt her. Mm-hmm. And so it's not like she is somehow Master accessing machines. the yeah, the computer, like hacking the database or whatever. <laughs> the files are the main inside frame. the computer. <laughs> I am really curious about the powers and abilities of these gods, but I want to round out this episode with talking about a not god, seemingly just a regular, yeah, a regular person. A very confusing character. The Black Bear. Uh, Let's dive deep into the Whalish King. There's so much mystery surrounding him in this story. We actually end up hearing quite a bit about him sprinkled out again throughout the whole of the story and he comes from before the time of Sephowin's grandfather so he's quite old and quote it is said he can only be slain by his own child and so far he has produced no children end quote therefore he is still alive yeah, many a prophecies exist in our own world about fathers who will be killed by their own children, leading to the death by the hand of their children in like weird roundabout ways. Which actually goes right back to your discussion about the cyclical time periods in mythology. I think in one version of Norse mythology, the idea is that most of the gods will die. In Ragnarok, mm-hmm. but some of the younger gods yes. will survive like the and second supplant generation. Yep. Yeah, their exactly. parents. 100%. And now stay with me here, because to me, we're talking now about a person who is at minimum like over 75 years old. Oh. She's older than the grandfather's time. Yes. So pretty old individual, potentially way older than 75. Yeah. Okay. This would be the person... The dimension hopper, the frugal wizard, <laughs> who showed up in who came between. In between. <laughs> yes. Logna Woden were the first people to arrive in this dimension. And then sometime, let's say like 200 years ago, the black bear shows up, establishes himself, and then John and Ulrich and all of those people arrive, you know, within the last 15, That's 20 interesting. years. And it, I don't. <laughs> We don't have enough for me to like be really confident about this theory. Yeah. But I do think it might explain some of the weirdness and how the black bear has this mythology growing around yeah. him. It's a good theory. We have a pretty good description of this character. Quote, the black bear, Sephowin said, slayer of gods, binder of monsters, king of men. When he turned Fenris the wolf against Frigg at the Battle of Baden, he took upon himself the curse of the land, binding it to his soul. Now his hounds haunt the forests, and he looks ever outward, immortal, yet fearing his own spawn more than anything. End quote. It gave me real Macbeth vibes. I'm just staring out. When Macbeth is like in his castle, just waiting for the woods to come to Dunsinane, fearing the man who was of no woman born. Yeah, that sounds about right. This is, he has this, you know, trapped vibe, a depressed conqueror type of thing going on. And the Black Bear sometimes is seemingly included in the pantheon of the gods, kind of like the weakest of the gods. He at least seems to be equally as powerful. They don't seem to worship him the same way as a god, but 
he seems to be significantly more powerful than the regular humans. We have this description from the last battle. Quote, the finest boast that men have ever heard, furious boast that drove back the black bear himself. Her power and confidence bound him to his land as if he were a white. That day, Frigg saved all of humankind, not only those of our land, but the Walish, the Hordemen, the distant Urians, and the men of the far lands, though they know it not. End quote. And black bear is highlighted in the text in that sentence, like... It's unbelievable that boasts could drive him back because he's so powerful. And she's saying he's so powerful that he even would have destroyed, you know, all the people around them. Pretty powerful. Sephawin tells us about stone castles that exist in the Black Bear's land. Definitely, you know, the medieval England traditional vibe yeah. probably includes a lot of castles. And this makes sense that in roughly the year 750 or when we dropped into this story, you would have proto castles mm. and things that were maybe not the high Middle Ages, massive yeah. castles with moats and multiple different levels but you would have a stone building that was like on a high hill with your farms and your people living around it that would to a group of people who lived in huts and or used natural materials structures. exactly yeah and rarely ever built multiple story places to live like maybe they could build a, a watchtower type of thing but it's just a, a completely different experience kind of otherworldly to see a stone building when every building you've ever seen is, is probably made out of wood and leathers and stuff this stone castle for the black bear idea is gonna become more relevant in just a second just some other small details about the black bear that we hear. Ailston says that the black bear has, quote, dark beasts who serve him. And then we also hear that the black bear's sword cannot be wielded by any other man. This, to me, is pointing to the black bear as a frugal wizard because oh, okay. we see with john and ryan that their weapons are biologically locked that yes. a gun cannot be but I used like or triggered they would not have a sword i don't think I'm, they wouldn't have a sword yeah but the black bear you don't have to come from john's dimension if there's infinite oh, dimensions okay we don't know Wait, so you're saying that the frugal wizard company is operating in multiple di dimensions and sending people out if there are Infinite dimensions, I don't know if there are, but if there are infinite dimensions, then yes, absolutely, the Frugal Wizard Company exists across multiple dimensions, and multiple ones are sending them to other dimensions. Okay. So a That's sword- That's a bigger theory than I was thinking. It's the problem that is introduced by <laughs> multiple dimensions. I think this is yeah. maybe the problem that- more recent Marvel movies, once you open up the dimension uh, thing, yeah. it's just a it's a struggle to keep everything in line. So I'll keep it a little bit tighter. Just the biological locking of the weapon jumped out to me as that similarity and that maybe there's a technological reason for someone not being able to wield his sword. So all of this leads us to the question, who is the Black Bear? We talked a bit about who Logna and Woden uh, are in our Earth mythology. Who the heck is the Black Bear? Does not seem to fit super mysterious. Yeah, and it certainly doesn't line up necessarily with any other Norse god or, you know, there's a lot of Norse gods. There's a large pantheon. They have lots of names and they kind of shift uh, over time. But I do think that a call out you made about King Arthur is a very interesting one. Yeah, this is one theory that the Black Bear is a stand-in for a King Arthur character archetype. Mm -hmm. Going back to our etymology, the word Arthur is said to mean bear, strongman, or bear man. However, the etymology of Arthur is 
surprisingly hotly contested. There is no scholarly consensus on where this name came from or what it means, which I found really interesting. It's definitely a common name. And then obviously the legend of King Arthur is world renowned. Yeah, but the scholars are like... We, we don't, don't know. know. Like, yeah. Nothing that we can think of really makes sense for where this name came from. There are often connections to a Roman influence. And so Arturus is sometimes given as King Arthur's true name, which gets you into a Latin base, but that doesn't really help us understand yeah. the meaning of what's going on here. I do think the connection to bear though even if it is contested is a pretty great one because brandon could have just seen that and been like i like that well exactly i'm sure that is what brandon was going off of even if it's not a hundred percent known clearly the most important connection to a king arthur though is the sword that we were just talking about excalibur pulled from the stone sometimes given by the lady of the lake is the symbol of arthur his realm and his eventual kingdom of camelot i think that and it is a symbol of his sovereignty yes of the fact that he is the ruler right that is one of the kind of important tie-ins is that arthur's sometimes a, a lost child and returns to prove it and he is the only one who can pull it from the stone because he is the rightful heir okay thought what if this is correct that the black bear is you know the whalish king the ruler the rightful heir he's actually a great guy he is real real cool and then these other people arrive the west warrens Mm -hmm. they bring these quote unquote god's suspicious face of Woden and Logna and that this is another sort of like a Stormlight Archive situation like the actual good person is the black bear even though we think he's the bad person of course if we're gonna jump into my crazy theories the frugal wizard company we know uses medieval England but in one of their documents they say You're not allowed to go outside of England, and we don't send anyone outside of England. But again, a frugal wizard company or the frugal wizard company could have other rules in place where they send people over to Norway. And so the black bear was sent to be the hero of medieval England. That's the role that he is performing. Another frugal wizard or multiple frugal wizards were sent over to Norway where they are the heroes there. Like they're both, everyone's doing the thing that they want to do. More that the black bear would be a native of this dimension and then is the victim of this interdimensional colonialism when Woden and Logna come in. I love that possibility as well. I'm just going to keep. You want everyone to be a wizard. Everyone is a wizard. The whole place is actually (laughs) only wizards. (laughs) Yeah. Oh, there's one other connection between. Our King Arthur and potentially the Black Bear, our King Arthur, basically the only thing we actually know about an Arthur during this point in history is that he fought the Saxons at the Battle of Baden, which is said of the Black Bear. And another mythological fact about the legendary King Arthur uh, is that he could only be killed by his son. Yes, and... Mordred was his son's yes. name who would eventually, you know, come to dethrone him. There's another possibility for who the Black Bear is. And I think that Brandon took from both of these mythological characters to mm, create nice. the Black Bear. There is a character in Norse mythology named Surtur. Yes. Who is a giant. Surtur literally means black or swarthy one. So we've got Black from Surtur, Bear from Arthur, the Black Bear. Surtur is said to be a major player in Ragnarok. He fights against the gods and he defeats Freya's twin brother, Freyr. (laughs) Very creative on the naming. And so this would also uh, kind of line up with Freyg being killed while fighting the Black Bear. Exactly. And I think... That's a great call for fans of the Marvel movies. This is what happened. And this is the character. He's the big, gigantic, Yeah, the big lava monster. Yeah. And he is called in to destroy Hela, 
the sister of Thor and Loki. So not quite a perfect lineup, yeah. but again, there is that element and the destruction of Asgard is their Ragnarok or that story's version of Ragnarok. Now, they try to go with the hopeful, you know, Asgard is a people, not a we place. We will rebuild. Exactly. And that doesn't work out because of Thanos. However, in this story, I like the idea of a man myth, a man who is also influenced by this myth. Oh, so I don't necessarily okay. think that he is directly suitor, but I think that his role could be that of suitor in this instance. Interesting. Yeah. I like how all of these archetypes play off of each other. I love finding these little mythological Easter eggs in this fictional story and kind of tracing where Brandon's inspirations may have come from. It adds kind of a fun element to the story. Obviously, we can't be looking for Cosmere connections. So instead, I'm looking for real world connections. Yeah, that idea of influence and inspiration and where does it come from and what does an author, Brandon, find interesting and worthy of pursuit. He had to clearly do a lot of research and has kind of demonstrated his interest in Norse mythology. I'm curious, always looking for breadcrumbs back to the possible Cosmere, if there is going to be the introduction of a world that maybe has some Norse mythology-esque things going oh. on. There's a couple of shards out there that have planets that we have not yet seen. Valor. And they have also, as I have stated, no real cold environments on display in the Cosmere. At oh. least right now, I haven't seen like any... Yeah, we don't have like a snow exactly. land. So we need one of those. And that's just all kind of lining up for some Norse-esque mythology in the Cosmere as a possibility. I don't Obviously think... Obviously on Valor planet. I think that could work out. And you have a Valor who would kind of fit the role of a frenzied Odin oh, if they were breaking okay. down. You know, if, uh -huh. the, if things were going wrong for Valor, I could definitely see a twisted Valor becoming, you know, more like Odin. I could see Valor being more of a Thor character. Certainly. I, I feel mean, like Thor is the Norse mythological character who embodies Valor. Valor. Definitely. Yeah. And I certainly would love some big lumberjack-esque Thor going on. I think Valor on. is actually a woman. <gasps> I think we hear that. Oh, don't, no. don't hold me to that, listeners. No, I think you're right. I, I do think that we have the men shards accounted for. Is uh, I think in what I think in the letter, it, there's just a pronoun mentioned of she. Okay, okay. So we have uh, the mighty Thor, Jane Foster, in that Marvel universe. But I think that uh, that would be really cool to see. I would like that. I don't necessarily think that's true, but what you said about- she could also have kind of like an Athena yeah. vibe. You could sort of combine those two things like we have combined mythological elements in this story and do a combination Lady Thor, Athena vibe. Okay. Well, we need this right now. Brandon, stop working on Stormlight Archives. We've done it. We've solved it. We figured it out, Brandon. We created the world. Now, please just write us like three more books. Only three. JK, we're going to need 38 more books to <laughs> complete the Cosmere. This has just been one of our note-heavy episodes on the mythology and this world that we have been introduced to in the Frugal Wizards Handbook. We're going to come back and talk about magic, whites, the rune stones, and kind of how the elements of magic in this world seem to be working. Mm -hmm. And how the mythology that we've talked about today is impacting the weird. We've got a lot in store for the book club episodes. We hope that you are having a great time. Feel free to reach out on Patreon or as always, you can email us directly, cosmereconvo at gmail.com. Let us know what you're thinking and how you feel about these, we'll say information dense episodes that we got going on here. Brooke, can you take us away? Until next time, life before death, strength before weakness, journey before destination.